So let me start a journey that began uh, for me in 1976. Things happened before 1976, but this is a later study from the Whitehall study of British civil servants, which you mentioned in your introduction. This shows mortality by grade of employment. I mean, imagine that you were invited to meet a senior civil servant. Really very boring, but you turn up in a civil service office in Whitehall and there's somebody in a uniform, not a pinstripe suit, but a blue serge uniform, who looks at your bag as you come in. And then you go to a clerical assistant who checks your name. In fact, you have to read upside down because they're not so good at reading it. So yeah, that's my name. And then they call upstairs and um, a clerical officer, who's a bit more senior, comes down to escort you upstairs. And then an executive officer is in the office. And there's a doctor and a statistician waiting to join the meeting with the top person. And then the junior administrator comes out and says, Fiona will be ready for you in a few minutes. And then finally, you get into the great woman or man's office. Now, in that trial by hierarchy, in the last 10 minutes, you've just traversed the full hierarchy of the British Civil Service. It takes some people a lifetime to, <laughs> but you've done in 10 minutes. The thing about that is that maps on to life expectancy. The office support grades, the people who are checking your bag when you come in, are there with the highest mortality. One is the average for the whole group. And then the clerical officers, then the professionals and executives, the people who were waiting to join the meeting, and then the mandarins, the ones who were born clutching umbrellas and bowler hats in the old world. A fourfold difference between top and bottom, but the key issue is it's a gradient. No one in the British Civil Service is poor. When you think that about 40% of the world's population live on $2 a day or less, about 20% live on $1.25 a day or less, no one in the British Civil Service is poor. But we've got this social gradient in mortality. That means you and I are involved in this. Now, when we think about inequalities in health, usually we think about poverty in health. And it's true. The poor have poor health because of their poverty. This is not about poverty. This is about inequality. The social gradient runs from top to bottom. Now, you might think that British civil servants form an odd basis for engagement in global health. But the British civil service, as we know, real, ruled half the world, the British Empire. They still set the model. But that's what got me involved. And I said initially, when we published these figures, that a top grade administrator was the perfect physical specimen, was the end point of biological evolution. Um, you couldn't do better than a British administrator, practically immortal, which <laughs> might account for some of our problems, but we'll leave that aside. But it was precisely thinking about the social causes of the gradient that got me involved in everything I did subsequently. If you look at smoking, it follows the social gradient. But why does smoking follow the social gradient? We need to think not just at the causes, but at the causes of the causes. <coughs> obesity tends to follow the social gradient. Why does obesity follow the social gradient? And if you were minded to say that people were feckless, irresponsible <coughs> for smoking and being overweight, why is it that fecklessness and irresponsibility follow the social gradient. 
It's all very well when one individual smokes or gets overweight to say, well, you really ought to behave differently. But when you've got a social pattern, then we have to ask a different sort of question. Why is it happening? Why is it patterned the way it is? So that got me thinking about the causes of the causes. Skipping ahead about 19 years, we've got to get home this evening, skipping ahead 19 years. It's a long story, but I'll make it short. I went to see J.W. Lee, who was a newly elected director general of WHO, and suggested that he might set up a commission on social determinants of health. I think that's known as chutzpah, um, suggesting such a thing. To my amazement, he agreed. And he did set it up and invited me to chair it. And we launched it in Santiago de Chile. President Lagos, president of Chile, the person with the ridiculous, stupid smile on his face is me. I was a bit overawed, I have to say, by all of this, all these important people. Um, and J.W. Lee, in his speech, said, this is not an academic exercise. Now, I'm a professor in a university. I think academic exercises are good things. But I knew what he meant. This is not just an academic exercise. But we want evidence for policy. You're very familiar with policy makers making policy and then scrabbling around for a bit of evidence to support their policy. But we wanted evidence to drive policy, not policy to drive evidence. President Lagos subsequently became, when he ceased to be president of Chile, a few months later, became a member of the commission. And so we had senior politicians, we had academics, and we were trying to marshal the world's evidence on social determinants of health to change things, to change the way things were done. And we produced our report in 2008. And we called it Closing the Gap in a Generation. We drew attention to the fact that life expectancy for women in Zimbabwe at that time was 42, and in Japan was 86, a 44-year gap in life expectancy across the world. I drew attention to the fact that in Glasgow, life expectancy in the poorest part of Glasgow for men was 54, eight years shorter than the average in India. And in the richest part of Glasgow was 82, a 28-year gap in life expectancy in one Scottish city. And we said, closing the gap in a generation. Are we bonkers? Shows what happens when you let academics loose on an important policy area. <laughs> and I said, it was a statement that we have the knowledge to close the gap in a generation. We have the means to close the gap in a generation. How could I say that? we have the means to close the gap in a generation. We put in our report that one billion people in the world live in slums. And we said it would cost $100 billion to upgrade the slums. And I thought, no one's going to take us seriously. Who's going to find $100 billion for anything? Last time I looked, we'd found $11 trillion to bail out the banks. For one one hundred and tenth of the money we found to bail out the banks, every urban dweller could have clean running water. Do we have the knowledge? We have the knowledge. Do we have the means? We have the means. Do we have the will? Do we have the political will? to close the gap in a generation. Now, I work at a university. I do research. So in saying we have the knowledge, it doesn't mean we stop doing research. We always need 
more research. Every scientific paper says, you know, more research is needed, and it's true. But we need more action too. And we said, this is a matter of social justice. I even put on the back of the report, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. Slightly unusual for a WHO publication, which usually says, you know, they've done something that, you know, bureaucratic you know, assembly. And I said, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. We said empowerment is key. And I thought of empowerment in three ways. If you haven't got the money to feed your children, you can't be empowered. So material conditions. Having control over your life, psychosocial. And having voice, being heard, political empowerment. And that can act at the level of the individual, the community, or indeed of whole countries. If you're negotiating in the World Trade Organization and no one's listening to your voice, your country can't be empowered. And we said creating the conditions for people to have control over their lives. We said in the report that a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs, unfair economic arrangements, and bad politics. WHO was not sure how they felt about bad politics. It's governed by ministers of health. And am I saying that bad politics? Well, <coughs> yeah, that's what we said. Our conceptual framework for the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, distribution of health and well-being, and then we look at the factors that influence the distribution of health and well-being, material circumstances, social cohesion, psychosocial factors, behaviours, biological factors, and the healthcare system. And those, in turn, are distributed unequally according to social position by education, occupation, income, gender, ethnicity, race. And that's affected by the socio-political context. So you talked about the conference season. The politics really matters. It sets the context for everything else. And we had three levels of recommendations in the Commission. Improve daily living conditions, tackle the inequitable distribution of power, money, and resources, <coughs> measure and understand the problem, and assess the impact of action. So in the conditions of daily life, we had recommendations on each of these. And then in the inequity in power, money, and resources, we said health equity in all policies, good global governance, gender equity, political empowerment, market responsibility, and fair financing. It was 2011, not 12. Be careful what you wish for. One Sunday evening, I was drafting our recommendations for the report, and I thought, oh, I've got a good idea. There should be a global conference where all countries report on what they've been doing on social determinants of health. So I put that down as a recommendation. The Commission has accepted it. Then a draft resolution went to the World Health Assembly. WHO did not want this. 38 ministers of health stood up at the World Health Assembly and spoke in favor of accepting the resolution. And WHO was hoping that the bit about a world conference would sort of get forgotten. And then Brazil stood up and said, we'll host it. We've put $3 million aside to host it in 2011, and we'll do it. And that got passed. So WHO is now stuck with this thing. And they had to do it. There was a Rio declaration. The medical students, the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, um, looked at the Rio declaration. And within minutes, I love the medical students, within minutes, they put up a thing on their website and said the Rio declaration said nothing about inequity in power, money, and resources. Well, I know why. Because a big country that I won't name, 
but it's somewhere between Mexico and Canada. <laughs> um, geography's not very good. Um, didn't want it in there. They didn't want it in there at all. In fact, they would have been happy to strike out all reference to the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. I wasn't going to... You're filming this. I better not say... Uh, yeah, I'll just tell you anyway. <laughs> the, at the Rio conference, they did a thing the first morning, the, first, the main beginning, of the 9 o'clock news. So the idea was that I would be interviewed and the American Secretary of Health and Human Services, the politician, would be interviewed by a BBC interview, by you know, one of these superstars from BBC World would interview us. And so she came over to me. I shouldn't be saying this. Anyway, the interviewer came over to me. We, we'd done a little thing. She went through with me what questions she would ask and said, I'll interview you for six minutes and then the US Secretary for six minutes. She came over just before we started and said, I'm sorry, the American delegation has told me that I have to interview the Secretary for longer than you. So I'm going to interview you for five and a half and her for six and a half. I thought, well, <laughs> I don't mind. It's given me something to dine out on. You know? <laughs> and then I didn't think about this, but one of my colleagues who was there told me about it. For some reason, the way they choreographed it was I went up on the stage first and she interviewed me. And then they showed a little video and she told me that I had to go down and then the secretary came up. Well, all the other sessions weren't done that like that. People were up on the stage and you would talk and you would talk and you would talk. That, you know, that's how we think about it. But one of my colleagues said, she was told, the American secretary did not want to be photographed with me up on the stage. Wow. Under the Obama administration. Good heavens. I'm not political. Who ever said health was political? Me? I just go by the evidence. Uh, one of my arguments is that health is a measure of how well we're doing as a society. And the distribution of health tells us a great deal. Are we doing well as a society? Yeah, not bad. Health is improving. Not as good as we could be because health inequalities are not diminishing. So it's quite a good measure, really. We're doing quite well, but not as well as we could be doing. Now, I showed you the gradient for Whitehall, the social gradient. What I've done here, this is not the gradient. ISCE, International Social Classification of Education, that's primary education, and this is tertiary education. So I've left out the intermediate steps. Now, there's a rumour going around Europe that Sweden, that's SE, is doing everything right, but it still has big inequalities. This is from our European review that we published. I look at this and say, really? This is life expectancy at 25 by education for men. Sweden, among these 15 countries, has the longest life expectancy at 25, and among the narrowest inequalities, the shallowest gradient. Estonia has the shortest life expectancy of these 15 countries and a steep gradient, a big gap between university education and primary education. And I think there's something else here. The difference between countries for people with university degrees is much less than the difference for people with primary education. In other words, they know how to get good health in Estonia and Hungary and Romania because they do it for people with university education. I imagined, I'm writing a book at the moment, I put in this, imagine a surreal conversation. You're in Hungary. And you say to your young child, 
you've got to do your homework so you can go to university and have a long life. And the child said, I'm a child. What do I care about a long life? I want to sniff the flowers and nourish my soul and gladden my heart. That my child's read Dickens, but um, <laughs> in Hungary, in Hungarian. Um, and you, know, you say you misunderstand. A long life is a measure of a good life. It may be that you don't care as a young child whether you have a few more years of life expectancy, but it's an indicator that it's been good throughout your life. Hmm, says the child. Well, if you cared so much about that, why didn't you arrange for me to be born in Sweden instead of Hungary? <laughs> and you say, be quiet and eat your vegetables. <laughs> child says, pulling ranks the last refuge of a scoundrel. This is no ordinary child. Um, <laughs> you say, okay, okay. Child says, I want to know why being good at grammar makes a bigger difference to my health in Hungary and Romania than it does in Sweden, Italy and Norway. What is it about knowing irregular verbs that improves my health? You're rather wishing you hadn't begun this conversation <laughs> at this stage. And you say, well, good point. I think education is important in two ways. Education is empowering always and everywhere. It gives people better life management skills. It, light is better than dark. You know, the reason that I took such pleasure in shaking hands to all these high achieving young people because they represent the future. Education's wonderful and it's good for all of us, whether you're in Hungary or Sweden. But there's a second thing about education. Education also tends to get you higher income, better living conditions, a better job, those other good things. Now, in Sweden, the difference in those other things is much less by education because the people with relatively little education still have good living conditions, still have access to health care and education and so on. But in Hungary and Estonia, there's much bigger differences. Charles says, you mean, if I go to university, that's like going across the Baltic to Sweden. Aha, you're halfway there already. And I'm telling this story because what it means is, yes, there are hierarchies in all societies and the hierarchies related to health, but the magnitude of the difference varies. We can make a difference. And that's very encouraging, because if the slope of the gradient was always the same everywhere, what could we do? But it isn't. It varies enormously. It's similar for women, although, as we commonly find, the gap is smaller for women than it is for men. When we look at infant mortality rates between countries, this is for mothers who have secondary or higher education and mothers who have no education. And you can see in every country, the mothers with more education have babies who are more likely to survive the first year of life. So there are these big country differences. That's Colombia, that's Mozambique, Chad, Guinea, Nigeria. There are these big country differences, but within each country, there are big differences by level of maternal education. Maternal education, education of women, is key to empowerment. I said empowerment. Education of women is key to empowerment. It impacts on their children's health. It impacts on their own health. It impacts on their sexuality. It impacts on their choice about childbearing, on whether they can control their lives. Education of women is absolutely key. And the idea, as has been put to me, that the gradient is somehow an effete concern of rich countries is quite wrong. This is the gradient in under five mortality for different countries by 
quintiles of wealth. Look at Uganda. And distinguished people have said to me, no, isn't the problem really the bottom 10%? Look at the middle quintile in Uganda at their under five mortality of about 160 per thousand live births. The middle quintile in Uganda is higher than the bottom quintile in India. So you wouldn't want to focus only on the bottom 10% in Uganda. You want to focus on the whole gradient. Everybody. You want to improve things for everybody. And in India, you'd want the bottom four quintiles to have the same under five mortality as the top quintile. So you'd want to flatten the gradient. But if you're in the top quintile in India, why wouldn't you want to have under five mortality as low as the top quintile in Peru? The implication of the gradient is we don't focus only on the worst off. We improve society. We've got to improve things for everybody. And it's possible. I was in Peru earlier this year, and I got out these figures before I went. This was the gradient in under five mortality in 2000, from 106 per thousand live births to 35. 12 years later, 43 to 20. Wow, this is terrific. Because when people ask me, have you got any good examples where it can be done? And I say, yes, I have. This is evidence-based optimism. <laughs> I can point to real life successes. I went to a remarkable meeting in Peru. The Prime Minister hosted a meeting with 11 other cabinet ministers and I was asked to go and tell them about social determinants of health. And I said to them, this has only happened to me once before in my life in Norway. I've subsequently heard that the Peruvian Prime Minister got sacked, but I hope that wasn't to do with the, the meeting we had. But the fact is, they wanted cross-government action. Because if you're going to address social determinants of health, you've got to have action across the whole of government. Um, which, this idea, every sector is a health sector. I was at a meeting in Norway, and the Norwegian foreign minister said, I am a health minister. Every minister, he said, is a health minister because what we do in our day job impacts on health. And I got a phone call a little while ago from an official in the Ministry of Health in Norway. And she said, you know, you've been going around the world quoting our foreign minister saying, I am a health minister. I said, yes. He now is our health minister. <laughs> <laughs> and he wants to meet you. So I went to Oslo to meet him, and I told him what I'd been saying, quoting him, and he said, I've just come from a county in southern Norway and meeting with local government people, and they told me that their plans were marmot certified. <laughs> so we had a little love in. Um, I said empowerment is important. First Nation Canadians, Aboriginal Canadians, have an appallingly high rate of suicide, at least three times the Canadian average. And the people who've written about this describe the fact that they live in bone-grinding poverty. But the academics who researched this phenomenon noted that some communities had no suicides and some had a great deal. And they had the idea, I'm not sure if they called it empowerment, but they classified communities on two cultural factors. Did they have high degree of self-government? And were they participating in land claims? And did they have community control of health services, education, cultural facilities, and police and fire services? The greater the number of these cultural factors and community control, the lower the youth <coughs> suicide rate. When communities were disempowered, chillingly, young people kill themselves. That's how potent 
disempowerment can be at the community level. And it's tragic. It really is tragic. And I visited Australian Aboriginal communities, and it's equally tragic. And the tragedy is knowing what the model is with Australian Aboriginals, with First Nation Canadians. Do they want to be plumbers and carpenters and nurses and teachers? Or do they want to be hunter-gatherers and live in a traditional style? What everybody's clear about is what they don't want to be is drunk and disorderly and drugs and unemployed and hanging around on the fringes of towns. That's not the model, but that's what's happening. So it really is tragic. But empowerment, to some extent at least, can avert this tragedy. I'm going to go on a very long time. I'd better speed up. We had a global commission. We made recommendations for 193 member states of the World Health Organization. How can you make a set of recommendations that are suitable for Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia and South America and North America and Europe and Glasgow? Well, we made a virtue of necessity and we said what should happen is that countries, regions, cities should conduct their own reviews in the light of the WHO Commission report on how to translate the recommendations into local context. Brazil set up their own Commission on Social Determinants of Health. President Lula looking totally delighted, but then Britain, Brazil didn't win the World Cup. So. Um, but there was a Brazilian commission, so Brazil were great champions for this. I had the honour to hand a copy of our report to Manmohan Singh, and he said, what would you like me to do? And I thought, he's the Prime Minister of one billion people, and I should tell him what to do. I said, with respect, <laughs> Prime Minister, that if you were minded to take our report to see how you could apply it in India, I think it would improve social conditions and health in India and set, you'd be a beacon for other countries. Well, not much happened in the first few years. And as a colleague of mine, Mirai Chatterjee, who's one of the leaders of the Self-Employed Women's Association in Gujarat, she said, just be patient, things take a while. And then she said, it's almost as if the government's going down through, she was a member of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, it's almost as if the government's going down through our recommendations and implementing them one by one. I went back to a meeting in India five years later, hosted by the Minister of Health, the Minister of Rural Development, and the Minister of Social Justice. I was delighted that India had a Minister of Social Justice. I said, shouldn't all ministers be ministers of social justice? <laughs> but they're happening. We have to see what happens in the new regime in India. But it's happening. Costa Rica. Costa Rica, as you may know, is one of the examples of a middle income, relatively poor country that has remarkably good health, longer life expectancy for men than the United States of America, but wants to do better. And we've been engaging with them. And in Peru, I mentioned this was the mayor of Lima, and she said she wanted Lima to be a beacon. Again, I, I wish I didn't have such a stupid expression on my face all the time. She had put this medal around my neck, and uh, the Medal of Lima, and she kissed me on the cheek. And I said, last time an important lady put a medal around my neck was Her Majesty the Queen. And she doesn't do kissing um, <laughs> with a gloved hand. But, uh, so we were smiling. But I went back to Lima after this, and they're getting the mayors involved, not just in Lima, but in rural areas in Peru. And 
in Britain. I was invited by the Labour government, Gordon, what's his name? You remember him? Um, to conduct a review of inequalities in England. How could we apply the findings and recommendations of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health to one country, England? And I called my review Fair Society, Healthy Lives. I said I'd get round to explaining the title. I said it was a statement that if we put fairness at the heart of all policy making, health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. I was giving a lecture to the opening session of the American Public Health Association. 7,000 people in the room. And I don't know what possessed me. I somehow imagined I was having a private conversation. And I said that I was slightly regretful that I'd given my review that title because I said the government we have in Britain at the moment, the Conservative-led coalition government, uses the word fairness as if it has no meaning at all. They cut the top rate of tax and they called it fair. They cut tax credits to the poor and they called it fair. They cut services to disadvantaged people and they called it fair. And I said, I call it a grotesque parody of fairness. Now, I say, I imagined I was somehow having a private conversation with these 7,000 people. In next week's British Medical Journal, there was an account of my speech. You know, British academic labels government grotesque parody of fairness. Well, I, <laughs> I use the word in a technical sense. Because <laughs> I'm not a politician. I mean, it's just evidence. I use it in a technical sense. Systematic inequalities between, in health, systematic inequalities in health between social groups that are judged to be avoidable by reasonable means and are not avoided are unfair. Therefore, any social policies that retard progress toward reduction of these avoidable social inequalities in health are unfair. So that's how I use it. It's not a label you tack on to a policy you were going to pursue for other reasons. And I believe in democracy. If the democratically elected government of the day wants to pursue a set of policies, then they do it, whether I like it or not. That's, we live in a democracy. So that's absolutely fine. But don't call it fair if it violates any usual sense of what fairness means. Say so we're doing it because we want to do it and you know, that fits with our philosophy or whatever it is. But don't call it fair. That unhinges the brain. You can't actually have a reasonable dialogue if you distort the English language that way. And if you believe in something, stand up for what you believe. Don't do it for one reason and call it something else or pretend you're doing something else. Stand up for it. And I'm not political. <laughs> oh, and then we did the European review of social determinants and the health divide. Figure one from the Marmot Review, the Fair Society Healthy Lives publication, was this. Each of those dots represents a small area of England, a neighbourhood, classified by income deprivation. And the top graph is life expectancy. And what you can see is people near the top, in terms of affluence, have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. People in the middle, shorter life expectancy than those near the top. People a third of the way from the bottom, shorter than those in the middle. It's all the way from top to bottom. The gap between the 5th centile and the 95th centile is seven years on average. I mentioned Glasgow, 28 years. I mean, there are communities we can spread it out. But on average, seven years. The bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. And the gap, the gradient steeper, and the gap between the 5th and the 95th centile is now not 7 years, but 17 years. 
In fact, we published uh, an update of these data last week, and we said that disability-free life expectancy, on average, for men was 63, and for women was 64. Now, if you want to advance retirement age to 68, and on average, disability-free life expectancy is only 63 or 64, people are going to have to work with a disability or they won't, be able, they won't be able to limp through to 68. They'll be on disability benefits, if there are any left, rather than on pensions. So if you want people to work longer, you've got to deal with the social gradient in disability-free life expectancy. So you asked me earlier, do the politicians listen? They listen to this. They realize they have to take that seriously. And in my English review, I had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life. <coughs> Education and lifelong learning. Employment and working conditions. <coughs> Number four, what a radical idea for a rich country. Everybody should have the minimum necessary for a healthy life. When I lectured to first year medical students at my university, and I talked to them about minimum income for healthy life, and say that in the calculation, for example, for older people, we say it's not just having the money to have a reasonable basket of food and to be warm at home, but it includes leading a life of dignity. And older people can't lead a life of dignity if they haven't enough money to buy presents for their grandchildren. And I say to these brilliant young people at UCL, you came to UCL because you wanted to study genomics and proteomics and metabolomics. And here's this lecturer saying, if your granny can't buy you a present for your birthday, then she can't have a healthy life. <coughs> they love it. They love it. <laughs> Create and develop healthy and sustainable places to live and work, and a social determinants approach to prevention. Distribution of power, money, and resources. I said to somebody earlier in the day, the Lancet thought they'd shut me up, and they sent me Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, to review. 685 pages of economics. I thought I could either write my book or read his. Uh, uh, this comes from Piketty and says, that's the share of total, this is US data, the share of total ho household income enjoyed by the top 1%. In 1928, the top 1% had 23% of total household income. And you know what happened next? <coughs> the Great Crash and the Global Depression. And their share came tumbling down to 10% or less. And through the 1950s and 1960s in the US, the economy grew 2.5%, 3% year on year. So the idea that you've got to set the 1% free in order to get economic growth is contradicted by the evidence. But 1978, 79, 80, it took off the Reagan revolution. Wow. By 2007, the top 1% again had 23% of total household income. And you remember what happened next? Another great crash. Now, I work in a university. I know that correlation does not necessarily mean causation. I could never claim that it was proved that the unconscionable greed of the top 1% brought the world's economy to its knees. But you have to admit, it's a reasonable hypothesis. <laughs> and in fact, Thomas Piketty is in no doubt that this concentration of income. He says that for 30 years up to 
2007-8, the bottom 80% in the US had income growth of about 0.5% a year. And everything saying, consume, spend, spend. So their debt levels were up to there, over their heads. So when the instability came, it, as inevitably it had to do, the whole thing came crashing down. But these guys got away scot-free. It didn't go down like that. They managed to preserve. There were no hedge fund managers jumping off skyscrapers as happened in the Great Depression, the Great Crash. And you ask, how is this good for any of us? Why is this good for society? Piketty's point is that this is income, but Piketty's point is that capital concentration is growing faster than income concentration. Now, I suggest that if you are a good conservative, don't know where to look. <laughs> <laughs> if you are a good conservative, you would think that people should be rewarded for merit and hard work. Didn't you hear that at the conference this week? rewarding hard-working families. So that's what good conservatives believe. But Piketty's point is, with the increasing concentration of capital, what's happening is people are getting rent on inherited capital. We're not rewarding hard work or merit. We're rewarding inherited wealth. And, he claims, that's not very good for society. And I think if you were a conservative, you wouldn't think that was good. And if you were left of centre, you wouldn't think that is good. I don't think that's good wherever you are on the political spectrum. That's got to be a bad thing. And what are we doing? We're reducing the tax on capital. And hitting working people round the head. And one of the problems with the increase in inequality in income is it gets transmitted to the next generation. So we're all in favour of social mobility. This metric compares the, oh my God, it's called intergenerational earnings elasticity. I'm going to do a test, if anybody can guess what that means. I'll tell you what it means. It compares the income of parents with the income of their adult children. So if there's no social mobility, in other words, rich parents, rich children, poor parents, poor children, middle parents, middle children, with no <coughs> movement, a country would score one. And if there's no relation between parents' income and children's income, a country would score zero. So, Denmark, Norway, Finland have a high degree of social mobility. The US and the UK have a very low degree of social mobility. And the problem is, it's correlated with inequality, the Gini coefficient. The higher the income inequality, the less social mobility. In other words, the greater the distance between the rungs of the ladder, the more difficult it is to get from one rung to the next. Makes sense. So these degrees of income inequality are damaging social mobility. And again, if you were a good conservative, you'd all be all in favor of social mobility. Get it, give every child a good start in life, give everybody a chance to succeed. And they're being blighted from the beginning by the distribution of income. And I, that's why I argue that a lot of what I'm saying ought to be taken on by right of centre parties or left of centre parties. It's about creating a better society. It's about improving things for our children. And if we improve things for our children, if you take a life course perspective, we'll improve health in adulthood reduce health inequalities. So, early life and education. Re read to every day at age three by socioeconomic status. Now, it was put to me when I was doing the English review that I would be reporting into an adverse economic climate. Here's a really expensive intervention. 
read to your children. <laughs> when I reported the English Review and my colleagues who helped me and I gave, in fact, we counted up in the first 10 months after we published the English Review, my colleagues who worked on it collectively gave 108 invited talks around England. So there was a real appetite for it in 10 months. They were giving 10 talks a month. And I gave 100 around the world in 12 months about the English Review and the Global. There was a real appetite that people really wanted to know about this stuff. So one talk that I gave in Yorkshire and Humberside, and they had 26 chief executives of local government and 26 chief executives of primary care trusts in the room together. The local regional director of public health was so excited. He said, we've never had this before, getting local government and PCTs together. And I showed this. And one chief executive of local government leapt to her feet and said, we should implement this this afternoon. <coughs> what are we waiting for, she said. And I thought, indeed, what are we waiting for? Now, when we published the data last week on early child development, saying that only 52% of children age five had a good level of development, and it was related to deprivation, but there was variation around the line. Some areas did better than others. And I said the implication of these data, of this evidence, is that two strategies, reduce deprivation, or improve services for children. Because if mothers are ground down, that's postnatal depression. If mothers are ground down by misery and poverty and everything else, the evidence is that good services make a difference. I think the implication of that is that increasing poverty for children is not a good thing for children's development and subsequent health. And cutting services for children is not a good thing. That's what the evidence shows. And globally, 58 million children, roughly, between the ages of 6 and 11 years, are out of school. This is a soluble problem. Do we have the knowledge? We have the knowledge. Do we have the means? We have the means. Are we going to solve this? And around 43% of those out of school, or 15 million girls and 10 million boys, will probably never attend. Employment and working conditions. I'm worried about your working conditions. Um, let me move on. <coughs> One of the things we want work to do is give people enough money to live on. These are Joseph Rountree Foundation data looking at the numbers of people in poverty where poverty is defined as an absolute, not a relative. The usual measure is less than 60% of median income. But this is the minimum income for healthy living measure. What do you need to eat, to heat, etc.? In 2011-12, a majority, a small majority, of people in poverty were in households where at least one adult was working. And in those households where at least one adult was working, three quarters of the adults were working. Now, a lot of the rhetoric, we've gone back to the Victorian era of blaming the poor for their poverty. These people in working households are not poor because they're irresponsible. They're not poor because they're feckless. They're not poor because they're not hardworking. They're poor because they're not paid enough. They're low paid. And you and I, the taxpayer, because they're, so, they're paid so little, they can't afford to rent houses, flats. So we subsidize by housing benefits. So we're subsidizing the corporations who won't pay them enough. The corporations say, we had to pay enough, we couldn't function. So we, the taxpayers, subsidize corporations 
and that will damage their health and it'll damage the health of their children. Social protection. Social expenditure makes a difference to health. So looking at European countries, this comes from our European review, the greater the generosity in spending on social protection, the better the health, the lower the proportion of people who report bad health. So Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, the former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe are pretty miserly on their social protection expenditure and have more people in poor health. Norway, Denmark, Netherlands are much more generous, Sweden, and they have fewer people in poor health. We're not bad, but we're not terrific in terms of social protection expenditure. <clears throat> Amartya Sen, who was a member of the Global Commission, <clears throat> picked up on what I'd been doing in my research, and you mentioned this in the Whitehall 2 study, we talked about lack of control at work, and I skipped over a slide, but lack of control at work related to increased risk of disease. Amartya Sen said the success of an economy and a society, not only is GDP, not only living well, but having control over their lives. We've all become GDP watchers. You look at the newspaper and you say, did the GDP, the gross domestic product, grow last quarter? That shouldn't be the metric of success. We want to know, did well-being? And I want to know, did health improve? Well, it doesn't improve quarter on quarter, but I think we have enough knowledge about what the key determinants of health are to be able to track those. And that's what we published last week. And we published two years ago, and we published the year before that. We can track these things. And I think right at the center is enabling people to lead flourishing lives. I've been asked by conservative ministers, where's personal responsibility in all this? And I say personal responsibility is right at the center. But we've got to create the conditions for people to take control over their lives create those conditions, and then, of course, it's up to each individual to take responsibility. But you can't ask somebody living in extreme poverty with no good services to take responsibility. You've got to create the conditions. So what we said with the Global Commission is we had a very simple idea. We wanted a world where social justice is taken seriously. Thank you.